Okay. All right. So I'm recording this meeting. Welcome. This is April 28th. It's our second impromptu idea exchange to help us all navigate these big changes in the time of physical distancing. We are particularly focused on how to help memory cafes meet virtually. And we're looking at that both in terms of how cafe coordinators navigate that change and also how teaching artists and activity facilitators navigate that change. And everything we do in the percolator is all about crowdsourcing your wisdom and sharing it, and today is no exception. So I just want to um, go over a little housekeeping here, let you know what we're going to be doing over the next hour. Um, so a little housekeeping, getting oriented in terms of who is participating today. And then I want to share with you results from a survey that we did um, of online cafes, Bowen cafes, folks connecting with their cafe group in other ways and share those, those ideas. Talk a little bit about the finances, which is always an important part of the equation, one that we don't necessarily always get a chance to talk about. I have some resources that I've accumulated to share with you. And then I want to just preview our next percolator meeting, which is our regularly scheduled quarterly meeting on Wednesday, June 10th. And um, that is meeting from 2.30, I'm sorry, from 1.30 to 3.30 um, Eastern time. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead. Now, last time we met earlier this month, I thought we would have some comforting nature images and you know, I wanted to mix it up. So I thought, what's another sort of comforting, soothing thing? And for me, it's all about bread and baked goods. So I hope that works for you too. So that's our kind of visual metaphor for today. So um, this meeting is being recorded. I should be able to have it in our meeting or archive along with the slides in about a week. And that is at our Percolator webpage. Please mute yourself unless you are speaking because we have 220 people registered for today. I'm going to be keeping everyone on mute for most or perhaps all of the time, but we'll definitely be leaving time at the end for us to discuss through the chat box. And there's also some folks who have contributed a lot of guidance through the survey and through exchanges with me about the virtual world and I may be um, calling on some of you to share your experiences later if you're willing to do that. Um, just for audio housekeeping, please make sure you're using only one option for your audio, either your computer speakers or your phone. And if you would like to be seen, um, you can activate your video option if you have a webcam. <laughs> Use the chat function at any point. And you can feel free to use it to say hello, to send your questions, to share resources. And um, again, the Percolator webpage is the place you want to go if you're not yet on our mailing list. And it's also where you can find all of our resources. So with that, um, we have a few different kinds of categories of people today on the call, we have memory cafe coordinators. We also have providers of other dementia friendly types of programs. We also have teaching artists and activity facilitators from a number of different modalities. Feel free to say hello and share your resources in the chat box at any point. So where are we coming from? So some of you have always done virtual programs. And I, I think that folks in that category have a lot to, to share with the rest of us. Most are new to this. So there's a lot of participants today who have sort of gone virtual over the past month or so. And some are really just learning what the ingredients are. So no matter where you are, you're welcome. And I hope you'll get something out of this next hour. Another aspect of the different places that we are coming from 
is that most are transitioning from an existing cafe to a virtual gathering. And, um, whoops. And some are starting from scratch with a new cafe. I've talked to several people who were planning to launch a cafe right before the pandemic began. And, and they, you know, um, Sue, Sue Spielman, my coworker who's on, are you able to admit people from the waiting room as they come in? If you can do that, are you able to do that, Sue? Mm -hmm. That would be a big help to me. We'll see, we'll see if that can work. Um, I can so, do that. Beth. Okay, great. That's great. That's Thank, great. You. Thank you. Sue is co-hosting with me, but we're just sort of figuring out what, um, what superpowers that does and doesn't give her. So thank you, Sue. Um, so in any case, some folks are starting from scratch with a new cafe. And I think that the concerns are very similar for people in that situation with a couple of exceptions. And I wanted to just point those out now. We know that really the biggest challenge for most who are running memory cafes is outreach because you are trying to engage people in an unfamiliar type of program, namely a memory cafe, and you're trying to break through the silence and stigma that surrounds dementia. So this is probably going to be even more challenging if the new cafe is a virtual cafe and you don't have all those typical physical ways of reaching people. So you really have to ask yourself, do you have a robust mailing list or do you have in other ways the capacity to do quite a bit of outreach? And then also to decide now whether you're gonna to continue to offer a way to take part virtually when eventually we do go back to in-person programs. Because what would be difficult is if people really join your cafe from the get-go as a virtual cafe and then perhaps they live fairly far away and at some point you go back to an in-person cafe and they're not able to participate anymore. So you would, you would want to plan for that scenario and make a decision in advance. So I also wanted to, just by way of framing, talk a little bit about some of the questions and ideas and phenomena that are arising as cafes work hard to transition to this virtual world. We all know that in many ways access has decreased. There are a lot of our participants who don't have internet or they don't have a computer or another device or they just simply are really uncomfortable or unfamiliar getting online. Also programming and visits have been completely shut down in many residences or limited and a lot of people are quarantined at home without a care partner to help them access programming. So that's clear. But I think another interesting thing that we're seeing is that access has increased in some ways. There's no need to travel right now to get to a virtual program. Geography is no longer a barrier. And just as an example, a new Memory Cafe has opened up in Brazil, Memory Cafe Brazil Online. It's available as a virtual program. And I know that there are Portuguese speakers in Greater Boston who are attending this wonderful cafe in Brazil. So, that is really exciting. It's a way the world actually gets smaller and that is happening too. Some questions that are arising, and I hope you bear with my, my pun here about um, dough rising, that's what I was trying for. Um, how much will guests bond with people whom they have only met virtually? We really don't know. I asked this at my first virtual memory cafe and one of the guests said, you know, we would go to virtual cafes located elsewhere just as something to do, but we wouldn't look to them for a sense of community. We look to the cafe that we've always gone to for that sense of community. And yet I really wonder if this goes on for six, 12 months, that may change. I think how we experience togetherness may evolve over time. So that remains to be seen. And then finally, when physical distancing ends or is reduced, can we maintain a virtual option? Because we definitely want to hold on to that increase in access that we are seeing. So let's dive in now and talk a little bit about online cafes. And all the information I'm sharing here has come 
from talking with lots of you and from um, the survey, and we'll get into that more specifically soon. So what are the raw ingredients if you want to start an online cafe? The host needs a platform and a level of comfort using it. Your guests are gonna need some kind of device, a smartphone, a tablet, or a computer. They're gonna need internet, and they're gonna need a level of comfort getting online. That is sometimes the hardest part. They're also gonna need to have any materials in-house that are necessary for that activity. So I've been seeing some wonderful things. I think Monique Morimoto, who's a drum teacher, is, is on the call and she had shared a video with, um, that demonstrated how she and her partner were using items from, from the kitchen, jars of spices, even graters and other kitchen items to create um, wonderful drumming sounds. So that would be an example of materials that someone could find at home, but you need to make sure that they do have those. And then if you have a guest facilitator, that person needs a virtual way to facilitate. So they need to plan out how they're gonna do what they do in a virtual world and to feel a level of comfort with the platform that you're using. So what are some considerations? First and foremost, security. And how you deal with that is gonna depend on the platform you use, but you're gonna to need to learn a little bit about how to prevent um, unwanted guests in your meeting. Confidentiality. So during the live program, are your guests comfortable with others seeing their video? Keeping in mind that you don't have control over the environment the way you do if they're actually coming to a physical program. They could be joining you from their living room and someone who lives with them might walk through the room and peek at the screen and see other people. So how are you gonna let them know of that potential and make sure they agree to it? And then if you decide to record your cafe, that issue is also significant. There might be folks who are happy to be seen during the live program, but they don't want their image shared in a recording. Presenters have to have a stable internet connection and reasonably good audio quality. So I'm sitting here right now and I have my laptop connected with an ethernet cable just so that I don't have to rely on Wi-Fi. So there are some technical considerations like that. Audio lag. Um, so we at the JFNCS Memory Cafe did a, a virtual sing-along um, earlier this month and we muted all the guests except for the singer because what happens is the audio has to travel through everyone's broadband, so it's out of sync. So even if people are great singers, and I, I can't say we all were, it really sounds like a cacophony unless you mute everybody. So that's something to be aware of. You wanna think about how you're gonna take attendance if that's something you need so that you can capture information for your mailing list or perhaps for funders and so forth. Um, some platforms like Zoom allow you to require registration in advance. That's what I did for this meeting. However, that's an extra step that could be complicated for people. Do you wanna ask people to put their name into the chat box when they join? Do you want to find another way? You can generate an attendance report from Zoom. Um, see if you can do that on the platform you're using. And finally, we know that a lot of guests have hearing loss and some of our guests are deaf as well. So it's good to know that closed captions can be accessed on many platforms. With regard to Zoom, it's not an automated function, but if your guest has a caption call phone or a phone with a caption call app, they can call into Zoom using that device and they will get captions. And I thank Ginny Mazur, who I think is on the call for sharing that information. So recording all or part of your cafe, that is something to consider. Um, recording can make the fun last longer. And yes, that is a picture of a giant, giant chocolate cake there. What are some considerations? Again, you have to think about the privacy of your guests and you can learn how to hide their video during the recording and that way, you don't need to worry that um, you don't need to, to worry that they're going to show. Um, copyright considerations of guest facilitator. So not every guest facilitator is going to be comfortable with you recording the session. 
because it may feel like it's giving away their product for free. It depends on what they do, but it's something you need to discuss with them in advance. And then you're going to need a place to upload your video. It's going to be a very large file, so you're going to need to upload it someplace and then you'll be able to share the link to it. But if you can do it, it's a wonderful thing. And here's a quote from the survey. One cafe guest said his wife watched the video 29 times in just a couple of days. So certainly having a recorded resource can be wonderful for people who are living with dementia. So now I wanna dive in a bit more specifically to the results of the survey. There was one survey for cafe coordinators and one for teaching artists. And there were 25 respondents. That's um, about a third of the number of people who usually respond to our surveys. And I think the reason for that low number is that people are just getting used to how to do virtual programming. I think we're early on in this process. So while there's clearly a lot of interest in it, we have huge turnout for this meeting, I think not that many people yet feel ready to share their expertise. I just am taking a pause here. Um, great, just making sure everybody's in the meeting. So here's what we learned from the survey. Most virtual cafes are using Zoom. Other platforms, GoToMeeting, Facebook Live, and BlueJeans. You can use any platform that you have access to and that you're comfortable with, of course. Who is participating? People living with dementia, people with intellectual developmental disabilities, either with or without dementia, care partners, bereaved care partners, and volunteers. So when I say bereaved care partners, it's not uncommon that um, care partners whose loved one with dementia has passed away, who had attended the cafe together, will keep attending and sometimes become a volunteer. Another thing that came clearly from the survey is that virtual cafes seem to be shorter and meet a bit more frequently than the in-person cafes. So the most common format was one to one and a half hours, two times a month, and several are meeting weekly. What kinds of activities are the virtual cafes doing? Um, casual conversation, talking about how folks are coping, reminiscing. Um, Timeslips.org, if you haven't been to that website, I encourage you to go. They have a wonderful creativity center. It's all free. They have something called Beautiful Questions, which are great conversation starters. A lot of cafes are doing games and they're coming up with creative ways to use the chat box or use the whiteboard function in Zoom. There's a lot of dance and movement, Zoom by Ageless Grace, exercise, etc. Self-Reiki, relaxation. There are a lot of cafes doing slide presentations with discussion. And I just wanted to mention Mary Beth Reidner, um, who presented at our March cafe about her program, Tales and Travel Memories is currently developing online versions of several of those wonderful literacy-based programs. So stay tuned on her website for that. Singing, drumming, musical concerts, open mic poetry, and one person did an Easter bonnet parade. So the sky's the limit. Um, so I just wanna mention a few examples. Dementia Mentors has been running virtual memory cafes on Zoom for many years. And Gary Joseph LeBlanc is on with us, and later on in the meeting, I'm going to ask him to say a little bit about this cafe, because I think it really shows that Zoom can be a wonderful way for people to really feel connected to one another. And there's a 12-minute demo on the website there, which is a great way to get a sense of how that cafe works. The Winds Cafe in Passaic, New Jersey, Rebecca has given her contact information, so they started running a weekly two-hour virtual cafe um, at least a month ago. Fox Valley Memory Project in Wisconsin, um, partnering with Kairos Alive to do a Zoom-based dancing program. And there's a video there that you can watch as well. And Susan McFadden, who is on this call today, is available to talk with you. Dementia-Friendly Communities of Northern Colorado is offering virtual variety shows. And there's the web link for that. And I know they're on the call as well. So some tips. Be prepared for challenges with technology. 
you need to assume that not everyone can connect. You could start by surveying your guests to learn what their needs are and to sort of get a sense of how comfortable folks are with going online. Regardless, you should plan to help with technology as much as you can. One of the respondents in the survey pointed out that it can feel like an added burden to care partners if now they have to figure out this technology and be the one to help their partner learn it step by step. You could consider sending guests a video tutorial or instructions on how to join your meeting. And on the resource slides that we'll get to at the end, I have some links to really user-friendly videos, one of which you could send to people to learn how to join a Zoom meeting. Take time to orient guests to audio, video, and chat functions at the beginning of the cafe, and it's good to do that each time. Remember that learning the technology is a potential opportunity for intergenerational sharing. Uh, it's you know, not, not um, obvious that older people are unfamiliar with this technology and that younger people are, but it is true that young people grew up in a world where this technology was just so common. So many times a grandchild can st step into that driver's seat and really help out. Uh, make all presenters or coordinators co-hosts, and that gives everyone certain controls to manage the online cafe. Be ready to mute everyone because there will be background noise. If you can, have a second staff person to help manage the cafe and design the session to work for telephone participation as well as online participation. And that way you've made it accessible to more people. And to do that, you just need to make sure you're verbally describing everything that's important. And if you need to, to send out materials in advance. For example, at our cafe, we're gonna have an art educator on Friday, and there were just a few people on our mailing list who do not use computers at all. And so I printed out the um, little versions of the images we're gonna be looking at, and I mailed those to those folks. Be aware that some guests with advanced dementia may find virtual programs confusing or disturbing. So one size does not fit all. That's true of any type of program we might offer. And in some cases, just looking at the screen, it's not engaging or it may even be confusing or upsetting. So folks can try it and if it doesn't work for them, then it doesn't work for them. And for that reason, it's really good to be ready to stay in touch with your guests in a few different ways so that no one feels abandoned. And this is a quote from the survey. One coordinator says, I'm doing phone calls to bridge the gap and I'm encouraging our guests to join the virtual meeting. So this person is, is staying in touch by phone and the online cafe is an option, but it may not work for everybody. For those without a device or with poor internet speed, um, so these are some tips that came from various places, um, ideas about buying an inexpensive device and raising money for that. Um, and in terms of internet, this person in Minnesota points out that a public library has placed its router in a window and anyone can park there for free in the lot and join the cafe from their car. So it's really important that you yourself get comfortable with the online platform. It is a process. I will freely admit I'm not 100% comfortable with Zoom yet, but I'm getting better each time. I think the best thing to do is watch tutorial videos and then try it out. So ask for help from a tech savvy friend or family member and run those test meetings with colleagues, friends, or relatives. And it can actually be a fun opportunity to connect with people who are far away. But there's nothing like those test meetings to help you really figure out how all these different options work and troubleshoot. And then finally, you can ask a second person to help you during the cafe. I also want to spotlight that Dave Weiderek has created an online directory for virtual cafes. So it's a great place to refer people who may want to attend them. And you can submit your virtual cafe listing at that website. So I'm gonna just keep going here, talk a little bit about phone-based cafes and other ways of connecting and just plow through our slides. And then I want to dive into your messages. So phone-based cafes, um, the raw ingredients are simpler. The host needs a conference call service. 
guests need phone, phone plan with enough minutes, which is not always, it, it can be easier said than done. They're gonna need that call-in information. You're gonna have to get that to them somehow. And then any materials they need for the activity. If you have a guest facilitator, they need a virtual way to facilitate. What do you need to consider? Confidentiality, again, it's different than having people physically come to a space that you control. You're gonna to need to verbally describe everything important because all you have is audio. And so you're gonna to wanna to choose activities that are really audio-based, such as conversation or music or games. If visual materials are needed, you've got to get those into people's hands in advance. From the survey, what we learned is that most folks who are offering phone-based programming are doing it as an adjunct to an online cafe. So in other words, they are having an online cafe, but people can just call in if they don't have a computer. There are not very many people who are just offering a cafe by phone. Um, activities include general conversation, reminiscing, games, poetry writing, singing, drumming, and dancing. So there's really a lot you can do over the phone. And here are some examples. Um, Amanda is on the call today, as I understand it. So in um, the Chicago area, she's running a program, it has been for quite some time, called Telephone Topics. And um, Well Connect is also a well-established phone-based program, and Rebecca Hafner is happy to chat about that. Poetry for Life is Gary Glazner's program, and here's a group of Poetry for Life co-conspirators. Gary runs the Alzheimer's Poetry Project, and this is a new offering, which is a 30-minute long show that sounds like old-fashioned radio and people are welcome to register and just call in. It's completely audio-based. And Gary is also happy to craft phone-based programs for individual organizations. So some tips. Expect a bit of chaos. People may all speak up at once. So you're gonna to wanna to establish some house rules and go over them. It's important that you have a list of who is on the phone so you can interact with people more easily and maybe to manage the issue of people talking over one another, you might wanna call on participants so that it's more organized. Make sure you have a way that folks can mute themselves or that you can mute them. And if this is a new program, you're gonna to have to put a lot of time into outreach because you're probably reaching people who are a little bit more isolated if the phone is what they rely on. Meals on Wheels can be a good partner, housing, um, places, faith communities, etc. So quickly, I'm gonna go through some ways to stay connected with your guests other than online or phone-based cafe. There are plenty of hybrids. So for example, you could have a live stream without interaction. And an example is Somerville Cambridge Elder Services and Two Sisters are offering live stream chair yoga. And these are all live links, and I sent you the slides, so you can click on these later and take a look at exactly what they're doing. But so that's a program they offer live, and they also record it. But when people take part live, they can't, um, there's not two-way interaction, it's just one way. You could also have a live program that you also record and share later. So for example, our Memory Cafe recorded our sing-along earlier this month and then shared that recording. You can also have a recorded program with a live time to talk afterward. And I know of a dance class that's doing that where there are recorded dance videos, but then they have a scheduled time for the group to get together virtually and have a conversation about what it was like doing the dance and just about how they're doing in general. Other methods of programming. So Two Life Communities, which is in the Boston area, is partnering with cable stations to record and then push out content to their residents and they're putting together a simple TV guide. Carrie Schmidt is happy to talk with folks who want more information. Rest Stop Ranch north of Boston has a beautiful outdoor garden where they have a memory cafe. And because it's spacious, they're able to offer private garden time to those who can drive there 
and it's it's something where there's physical distance so people can actually go and enjoy the plants. Poetry therapist Patty Russo, who's on the line with us, has created a video blog of poetry, which is really wonderful. Check it out. Other ways to stay in touch. Phone calls and cards made by cafe volunteers. A lot of cafes are doing that. Frequent email and Facebook updates. Some cafes are creating phone trees of cafe participants. It just depends how your cafe is structured. But there are some that are very small and there's a lot of intimacy among participants. And so that way everybody's staying in touch with one another. You can compile and share lists of activities that guests can do at home, whether online or not. And again, highly recommend time slips where there are the beautiful questions, mini projects, make up a story, a lot of resources there. Um, here is Donna in um, Illinois, um, putting together packets and mailing those out. The Positive Note Chorus in Wisconsin records sing-along videos and provides lyrics that people can enjoy on their own time. And then cafes are also helping to support basic needs and safety check-ins in some cases. So one person talked about dropping off masks and materials for a baking or rock painting project and a food drop-off coupled with physical distant conversation in front of the house with a care partner. <coughs> Excuse me. And then another cafe wrote about this concept called curtain calls for two individuals living alone in the same town where they actually agreed to look out for each other by opening their curtains to show that they're okay and if not to call and check on one another. So all great ideas. I'm coming toward the end of my slides where we're gonna get into your questions and comments and a little bit more sharing, but I wanted to first just talk about the other kind of bread, namely money. All of us are facing resource constraints right now. Organizations that host cafes are facing budget shortfalls. And there's just a thousand ways that, that they are affected whether they depend on philanthropy, which is being pulled in different directions right now, whether they depend on participant fees, whether they're funded through their state budget, things are really um, changing and a bit scary um, in the economy right now. So if you want to save money, you can often find volunteers to lead cafe activities. And in fact, it's something that people enjoy so much and sometimes it brings them a lot of happiness to be able to lead singing or um, do a little talk about a trip they went on or in some way share a little bit of themselves with the cafe. If you do want professional quality programs, it's very important to plan to pay for them. So I just want to spotlight the fact that teaching artists and freelancers have really lost sources of income right now. Um, and um, I think it's extremely important that we all be sensitive to that. They, um, you know, many musicians have, have do private teaching and that's ended. Um, residences have stopped their programs, just all the typical things that people often do um, for income are, are, are changed or dried up right now. So if, if memory cafes want to hire a teaching artist or an activity facilitator, I recommend to start by assuming that the fee will be the same as before. Now, it may be less because there's no travel time. However, it may be more um, depending on what the activity is. If video production or editing is involved, that's a lot of time. And so it's quite possible they will need an additional payment for that. And then finally, Please discuss copyright issues first if you want to record the cafe. It's really important to not record the cafe without clearing that with your guest facilitator first. So with that, I'm going to go to the chat here and I see we've had lots and lots of comments. Um, and actually what I'd love to do, while I'm kind of getting up to speed on those, I would love to ask, if um, 
Sorry, I'm just getting myself organized. Beth, here. Beth? Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Um, I private messaged you some of the questions that came up to make it easier for oh, you. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Sue. So I think while I'm looking at those, I'm wondering if Gary Joseph LeBlanc of Dementia Mentors, who has run the virtual memory cafes for so many years, would be able to speak to us briefly about what that experience has been like and anything that he'd want to share. So, Gary, can you go ahead and, and speak with us for a few minutes? Yeah. Can you hear me, Beth? I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having us. A great, great presentation. Thank you for And it's good to see you again. It's been a long yeah, time. Yeah, you too. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, I've been, I started online dementia caregiving support groups over 11 years ago. Um, we were probably the first and the original one that pioneered this whole concept on it. Uh, my Zoom account is, I'm grandfathered in in the very beginning price limit because I've had my Zoom account for so long. Mm -hmm. But six and a half years ago, I started Dementia Mentors. And the concept of Dementia Mentors is only for people living with dementia. And we've actually built this group up to now. We do 40 memory cafes a month online to Zoom on it. We have really built on it. But we're very fantastic. I got from the UK all the way to South Africa. So we're in so many different time zones we're doing at different times of day to keep everybody go moving throughout the time zones. It gets a little crazy. Daylight savings, it gets insane. Everybody's switching time. Some people like switching time. So it gets a little complicated on certain things on it. But the family, there was one of your questions was like, how do these people actually interact? And do they build a bond? I, I got to tell you, uh, virtually, these people have become family. Uh, it's unbelievable the relationship they have built through these memory cafes online on it. And like I said, this is only people who are living with dementia. And I very rarely, maybe once or twice a year, I let a guest come in to actually see what we're doing. Beth was one of them. And amazing how much these people actually open up because there's only people there with dementia. And the honesty is just unbelievable with these folks and the conversations they have. And to, and to be honest, I have learned so much from these folks. There's not a university on this planet that could teach me about, you know, front temporal lobe dementia, I mean, Louis bodies, all of this at the concept in the conversations. So the concept has been great, but you got to keep up to the times on it. Like you had a little thing with the waiting memory cap, uh, the waiting room, we have to come on to Zoom now. That's yeah. a new feature. I disabled that for all the people. You go to your settings, disable it, because I didn't want to confuse the people with dementia. So you got to keep things going. Sometimes it'll change the program on you, but you want to keep the program the same uh, as much as possible. And sometimes you can't, but... Um, I can't speak highly enough on the program on uh, what has happened. So I'm watching these people. They come. They're a complete mess. Some of them are just getting diagnosed. And with two, three months, all of a sudden, they got confidence. They got friends. Uh, and the whole world is getting turned around in a better way. Socialism is so important for these folks living with dementia. It's one of the number one things we can do for them. It's the one thing we're offering. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, I think it's really inspiring that you've been doing this for over six years and you're serving such an important need. Now, with the increasing number of people who are looking for virtual get-togethers like this, if, if some of the folks on the call um, know people who might be interested, can they refer them to dementia mentors? Do you have capacity for more? Um, we have a little bit more capacity. On it. We are getting, I've got about 140 members right now. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are on almost every single meeting. Some we see once a week. I mean, it's all different different times and I because I have a different time zone so it breaks things up a little bit on it. Uh, if you go to dementia mentors.org, there's a registration form. You can just go to the virtual memory cafe. And the other thing we're offering is one-on-one -on -one session. We call it mentor sessions, where if you first newly getting diagnosed with Louis bodies, I will set you up one-on-one -on -one with another person with Louis bodies and you can have that one-on-one -on -one match. Those one-on-one -on -one sessions, we eventually want them to turn into the virtual memory cafe, but sometimes they might not be ready to face the whole group. So we start them off one on one, and then we build them into their whole cafe five something. So, all the way around, it's just so impressive. It truly is. What an amazing resource! Thank you so much, Gary, for sharing Thank that with welcome. us and for everything you've done for so many years. And so, it's really good to know about the particular way that your cafes and your mentoring program are structured. And I think we all know people who could really benefit from more than one thing. Who could really benefit from a one on one who could benefit from a, a cafe like yours where there's the focus is talking and getting to know each other. And they could also benefit from programs that are more activity or arts-based. So it's kind of all of the above. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, you're um, very welcome. 
Thank you. Really appreciate it. So I'm going to look at a couple of the questions here. Um, there was a question about um, closed captioning, and um, you will all have access to these slides, so you can always go back and see what's there. But the main point is that when you're offering a cafe through an online platform, the, your guests are going to have some control over the interface. And if a person has a captioned phone, or a phone with an app that provides captioning, they can use that phone to call into Zoom or to call into GoToMeeting or what have you and get the captions on it. So that may be something that you just instruct them that they can do that rather than providing the captioning themselves. There are some platforms, I believe Google Hangouts has automated captioning. The captioning's not necessarily very good, but some platforms also just have that as an option that you can choose. There was another question about um, a disclaimer around confidentiality. And um, I would be happy to share mine if folks want to email me offline about that. But basically, we have um, language that we tried to put into um, plain language that is saying, we will do, we as the provider of the cafe will do everything we can to use the security options that the platform offers. And we ask our participants to do everything they can do by choosing us a, a private location to participate from. And the third part is we tell them we can't guarantee that someone else might not walk through the room and see who is participating. And so if they decide to join the cafe, their participation means that they have consented to that. So those are basically the points and you can sort of put it into the language that seems appropriate to you. Um, let's see, if a person is unwilling to turn on their video, is that a concern? Um, I think it's very important that people have the option to share or not share their video. And with regard to dementia, there's actually a particular angle here because some people with more advanced dementia might find it confusing to see their video on the screen. This is something I've heard about, not just with regard to cafes, but with regard to families having Zoom calls and so forth together is sometimes it's been helpful to um, disable one's own video so that you don't see yourself. Um, some people just don't feel comfortable showing themselves that way, regardless of dementia or not. And so I think it's, it's important for people to have the option and in fact for you to show them how to operate that option at the beginning so that they know how. Um, of course, there has become sort of an etiquette to teleconferencing and that sharing your video, it's kind of a friendly thing to do. Um, and it does give you a lot of feedback you don't have if you can't see people. So it's nuanced, but I think in the end, people need the right to control that themselves. My opinion there. Um, I'm just looking through the chat to see what other questions or comments may be. Um, concerns about linking participants to each other with regard to confidentiality. Um, I think we just have to think about confidentiality with regard to everything we do, um, including if volunteers are going to make phone calls or send cards to folks. You have to think about whether your volunteers have had a background check. Are there volunteers who really you feel you can trust with phone numbers? Um, do you want it all to go through you in a more centralized way so that you're never sharing personal information? These are, it's not that there's one right answer, it just seems important to consider it. Um, here's, um, Kathy says she's on her local arts council and that they are focusing on funding local artists relative to COVID-19. Um, and I think this is a really important point. Um, there are a lot of grant programs right now for artists, but they tend to be small and, you know, it's People have to make a living and there's a lot of transition right now. Um, let's see, just looking at the assistive 
technology through Easter Seals or their lo local aging services access point. So it's a good point that some of your participants might be eligible to receive technology through another program, whether it be a government program or a local nonprofit. Um, I've also found that there are funders who want to pay for tablets and so forth. It's a very concrete way to help people. So um, look for resources because there can be a way to get people set up online. Pros or cons of various platforms. So in the resources, I have shared a link that has a kind of walkthrough of different platforms. So you can take a look at that there. Um, in general, I would say if you are part of an organization and that organization supports a platform, and if you have a paid account and tech support, go with that one. If you're starting from scratch, I think that Zoom is one of the simpler ones and it's become so common. So there's an advantage to using a platform that people are quite likely to be using in other areas of their life. So if you're starting from scratch, I think that's a good place to start. So I'm just gonna go through the resource slides so that you all see what's here and then we can take a few more questions if we have time. Um, so several Percolator members from all over the country shared their contact information um, because they are running online cafes and they're happy to share their experience. So I know this is tiny text, but it's in the slides and you can look later, see if there's someone located near you or just somebody that you wanna reach out to. You can always Google their cafe online, take a look, see what you can find out, and then you're welcome to contact them for more information. So I thank all these folks for their generosity and sharing. The Percolator website here, jfcsboston.org forward slash percolator is where I store all of our resources. And I wanted to call your attention to the guest artist facilitator directory there, which um, is just folks in Massachusetts. However, at this point, geography is no longer a barrier. So I want to just let folks from other parts of the country know that if you want to find experienced teaching artists who have worked at memory cafes, there are a lot of people in that directory. And there are two, the two columns, the two last columns have been added, which ask if they do online facilitation and if they'll do rec recorded programs. So you can feel free to look at that and you might wanna start a directory in your area as well. Um, many of you are participants in the Percolator Google group where you can ask each other questions directly. So let's say, after this webinar ends, you really want to ask, um, you know, folks doing visual art, what resources are you having people use at home? That would be a question that you could post to the Google group and you'll probably get several answers from around the country. If you're not on the Google group and you'd like to be, just send me an email and I'll get that invitation out to you. Finally, timeslips.org is a really a kindred spirit here and they've been doing wonderful webinars about navigating this virtual world and that's the link there for their webinars and really look at all their resources if you haven't. It's very, very useful resource for memory cafes. And again, there is the link to list your virtual memory cafe. So for teaching artists and activity facilitators, um, the Mark Morris Dance for Parkinson's has put out a guide to facilitating online classes. So it's really focused on dance. Um, I think it's extremely useful for anyone doing movement, anything in that, in that kind of category. And I thank Art Sullivan, who's a dance instructor um, here for sharing that. And then there's also a link here for freelance artists um, and, and freelancers that just has a lot of resources for people navigating the virtual world. I had mentioned here as a link, thank you to Tim Kane for sharing this, comparing and contrasting platforms for music lesson instruction, but I think you can go through that and learn a lot about different online platforms that you might wanna use for your memory cafe. And then I just, I had found online these three videos by Marcia Chadley who runs the Creative Life Center in the Denver area, which I think are very user-friendly 
videos for learning how to join a Zoom meeting, how to host a Zoom meeting, and how to use Zoom safely. So I think those are good. And this first one, joining a Zoom call for the first time, is actually a good resource for our participants. And then finally, I wanted to mention that our Percolator quarterly meeting, which is Wednesday, June 10th, will focus on the virtual world. So we'll have a presentation about a virtual cafe. And I'm looking for um, a few teaching artists who are experienced in this new approach um, in different um, modalities who would like to share their experience on that um, in that meeting. So I'll be back in touch with some of you about that. So with that, I want to use the rest of our time to talk about more questions here. Let's see. Um, just looking here to see what else. Folks are doing so many great things. It's really very exciting. Tom Madden, who's on the call, is streaming a show at 4 p.m. today. That's Eastern time on Zoom. And you can find him here in the chat box. You can email him if you like, and um, he will send you the connection. One question I received by email earlier today is pros and cons of doing a recorded program as opposed to live. And um, so I think it's an interesting question. If you do a live program, you have the option of interaction. And I think that helps to engage people and it helps them to feel more of that sense of community and connection. Um, however, it's harder to learn to join a live meeting. If you're joining a live meeting, you have to have the internet, you have to have the device, you have to navigate the platform, you have to navigate all the controls. So that's a bit challenging. If you have a recorded program, it's a lot easier for people to access. It's just clicking a link and watching a video. Um, however, it, there's no interaction. Um, as we mentioned before, a recording can be watched multiple times and that's a real asset. So I think it's nice to consider ways to do both, to have an online meeting that you, um, that you consider recording and then you get sort of both options. Um, so I'm wondering in the last few minutes if um, any of the um, guest artists who are on the call who have been doing virtual programming would like to just share a little bit about what, what they've learned, what they're doing, what works. So um, I know, for example, Audrey Albert King, Cornell Coley, um, let's see. Tim Kane, um, I'm just mentioning a few, Patty Russo, several, Monique Morimoto, several folks are on the line who've been doing virtual facilitation. And if you'd like to share a few words about that experience, please feel free to unmute yourself and, and go ahead. Hi, this is Emily Brenner. I don't know if you, you can hear me okay. We can hear you fine, Emily. Go right Thank ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm just very briefly, I have not done any uh, memory cafes or anything virtually, but for the last uh, five and a half weeks, I have been teaching uh, five to seven virtual classes online every day uh, between, for a lot, mostly for seniors, all for seniors really, uh, group exercise, Zumba, yoga dance. Um, chair exercise. So I guess my what what I really wanted to emphasize is uh hand holding for uh seniors um for technology. So I've spent many hours on the phone uh like on the phone and then also on Zoom saying okay, I I just sent you the link, click the link. Now so do you join the audio now do you, and it's a it's a like a long process of hand holding but it is so worth it and they are so appreciative um so yes that's all i would say to really to not have that be an impediment um really reaching out to people and saying all right when are you free call me we'll do this so you talk with them over the phone while you're going through it thank that's you for everything uh beth 
That's so helpful, Emily. I really appreciate that. And I think you can see it as an investment, not only in their participation in your cafe, but really in their ability to navigate this world. And I think we're all realizing that some degree of physical distancing is gonna be with us for quite some time. So the investment that you're making by spending that time on the phone with folks is really giving them access to a lot of resources that are gonna be quite important for them for quite some time. So thank you. Anyone Thanks. else? I'll just, I'll just open it up. We have five more minutes. Anyone who wants to make a comment, please unmute yourself and go ahead. And this is Mary in Topsfield. We just had a, a virtual memory cafe and I'd love to know when you're the facilitator and you're trying to also handhold someone through the technology, did you have a second person uh, doing the handholding while you were you know, engaging the people as the facilitator? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, no, I would love a second person, but um, no. So what, what I do is I take, and this is why it's been so, so busy, is that I take the time, it's either before or after a class. I'll, I'm in, in email or phone or text communication with, with my people. Um, so they'll say, oh, I wanted to get on this morning, but I, I couldn't, I had trouble. And I'll say, okay, when is a good time for you later today? Call me. We'll do it together. Uh, so it's either before or after the class. And then I have people type in the chat questions. I mean, your people might not be, might not be as capable of doing the, the chat, um, but they'll type in the chat, oh, I'm having trouble with my video freezing. And I'll say, okay, I'll like, we'll talk after class about weight tips. Oh, oh, another good tip. Uh, because a lot of times people's ba uh, Zoom takes up a lot of bandwidth. I'm doing it on Zoom. Make sure all of your other programs and browsers are closed out when you're on Zoom. So email closed out, um, all the internet stuff closed out, Word documents closed out, so that you're really just taking up the bandwidth for Zoom. And then for me, it's my iTunes because I need the music. Uh, another helpful hint for playing music through, if, if music is in your experience, play the music through the same device that you're using Zoom with. So for me, it's my computer and sh you have to share your audio sound and that makes the sound quality excellent. Um, and if anyone uh, has any further questions on that, I don't want to take up more of your time. So I'll uh, type my email or and phone number in the chat and you guys can contact me. That would be great. Thank you so much, Emily. Very, okay. very helpful. Cindy, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Thanks. I have a question regarding if there's a standing date for the cafe, let's say it's every Thursday at 10, are people sending out kind of a reminder email? Is this a regularly scheduled, you know, the join now that's in the invitations we get? Curious about how for this population that does have some tech challenges, how are people uh, handling the invitation and the join now function? Can I answer that? This is uh, Gary from Dementia Mentors. Uh, what, what I do is everybody, I get automatic emails set up 45 minutes before the cafe starts. And I have like a click button join here, which autom automatically has the link from the Zoom meeting right in there. So it's very simple for them. They automatically get the email and says to join meeting, click here, click and they're in the meeting. One of the best things I love about Zoom, no passwords, no nothing. You can go around all that and make it as easy as possible for your members. Thank That's you. great. And I think there's um, an interesting kind of quandary with that too, because in some cases, posting a, um, the access information can open it up to this phenomenon that we've been hearing about called Zoom bombing. So it just depends. Um, you know, I think it depends who, who's going to be seeing that information. Um, do you have some way of sort of filtering or feeling comfortable that only the people who you want to come into the meeting are going to see it. I think that doing something like posting the meeting ID on Facebook, for example, is really risky because it just can get out there to anyone. And there are people, unfortunately, who are using that kind of information to crash meetings. Um, so there, both, both aspects are really important, the access aspect and the security aspect. Anybody else? Um, so actually, I see that we're at time, but I'm happy to stay on for another five minutes if folks have 
um, a last question or two or a last point that they want to share. Beth? Hi, Pat. Hi. Um, I did a virtual cafe uh, yesterday, and I was a little disappointed because I used an artist that sang and played guitar. And the music was really choppy. I think it was on her end because she didn't have adequate ways to mix the voice and the music. Mm -hmm. Do you find that's a problem? Yet I, I, I downloaded a happy birthday song from YouTube, and I played that, and that was great. Mm -hmm. uh, there didn't seem to be any distortion in the sound. Is there anybody on who can answer Pat's question? So I would say that um, audio is is very challenging when you're trying to, oh, Cornell, did you want to answer that? Yeah, I was looking for my audio button. Oh, great. Go go right ahead, please. But when you have the, the music programmed into your computer and you play it out, as she, Beth said, it's fine. But when you have live music and it's a singer and a guitarist or any other instrument, if... Um, you have a good quality mic, it makes a huge difference. And if you have your Zoom audio adjustments at the right settings, you have to change the basic settings on them so that they don't filter out the, um, the instrument, uh, thinking it's background noise, and that the audio is um, clean and doesn't break up because that's what happens a lot. A lot of Zoom meetings, the bandwidth isn't sufficient and the audio breaks up. And that could have been happening at her house. Yep, absolutely. Thank you. You're Thanks. welcome. That's really helpful. Yeah, I think that it seems like the default settings in Zoom are kind of optimized for speaking, for meetings. And so just as you're saying, Cornell, it, Zoom may interpret music, especially the more subtle tones, as background noise and actually block it. Um, I had seen a colleague who was using um, a, a, a meditation bell in a meeting, and you really couldn't hear it at all because it was so subtle. Zoom was just screening it out. So thank you for that input. Beth, so another I, workaround? Go right ahead, Tom. Another workaround. This is how I do it here. I don't want to use the microphone in the iPad as my microphone for music. So I actually run my music through my mixing console with a high quality microphones and a direct to the computer. Then on the computer itself, I open up a Zoom meeting as a second guest. You probably see me up there twice. There's a black and white of me, and there's a, uh, a regular video of me out there. Mm -hmm. The black and white's how I send the music. So it doesn't use this, my bypasses this microphone and the iPad altogether. It's clean. Yep. Beth, this is Eve from the South Shore Conservatory. Hi, Eve. If, if, I, if I could just add, too, we've been doing um, lots of lessons online. I'm a music therapist. I'm doing teletherapy. I think um, I'm not as sophisticated as Tom with the mixing piece or whatnot, but um, it's made a world of difference to have a microphone. I, I hadn't used a, a, um, an external mic for a long time, and I purchased one just for this purpose, and it's made a huge difference. So if you're hiring somebody to do things, you should probably just ask them what they're using and encourage them to use a microphone at least. That's going to solve some of the challenges. Fantastic. Great. One more comment um, that I could contribute um, is in the past, if you could ask your artists ahead of time if they can directly connect to Wi-Fi if they have the right cable, um, it can really increase the bandwidth and increase the quality. And the other thing, and you probably do this already, is just to, to run a test ahead of time um, with the artist just to see if what they're using is coming through clearly. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Anybody else want to ask a last question or make a last point? Okay, so I'm going to thank you all so much for participating and a, a huge thank you to those of you who uh, filled out the survey and just for all your eagerness and willingness to share with one another. It's um, a constant source of inspiration to me and I learn so much every time.
and I hope that we are all moving into this virtual world with a little bit more sense of confidence. We're all in it together. Um, Percolator will meet again in June, but in the meantime, feel free to be in touch at any point. I will post the recording and the slides from today's meeting um, at, a, at a, the Percolator webpage in about a week. So please be safe, stay well, take good care, keep doing the great work you're doing, and we'll talk to you soon. Take care now. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Great to see you all.